Happy birthday, America! Today is July the 4th of 2021, as we set aside this day to remember our independence. Sometimes in some of the programs, uh, whether it's on a YouTube video or on TV, uh, some personality may go around with a microphone and talk to people to ask them about the significance of certain events or certain dates in history. And uh, I, I saw one the other day, just I was watching, and uh, most of the people had no clue about the founding of our country. You know, he was asking about July the 4th, and in what year did we declare our independence? Sometimes people would pick about in the 1800s, other years. I think one of them said 1492, and I was thinking to the, the guy asking the question, you should have said, that was the year Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It seems like a lot of uh, young people are not getting the education that they should have. Um, in some of the uh, other people that he talked to, he would ask questions like, well, who are we declaring independence from? They wouldn't have a clue. They had no idea. It's like American history is lost from their minds. And no wonder so many uh, young people are being confused about the history of our nation because we have people right now trying to rewrite our history. Well, I thank the Lord for our founding fathers. And that was one of the questions. Who are some of our founding fathers? Somebody said Abraham Lincoln. Now, he comes along a lot later, about 100 years or so later. It is, it's that, it seems like people just don't understand about why we are here and where we came from. And I think that same thing happens spiritually that a lot of people today do not know God's word and do not know where we come from or why we are here. And that's why my message is from time to time. I try to back up and, and look at some things even out of the past to help us understand where we're at in the present and where we are going to go. In my message this morning, I'm asking the question, where is God when you need him? If I were to ask people here in the congregation today to raise your hand, if you need God in your life, I imagine every hand would go up. You know, when I ask people if they knew where God was when you need him. I'm not sure we'd get every hand up, but I hope we'd get a majority of the hands up. Do you know where God is? Do you know how to get a hold of God when you need help? I hope you do. And I see some in our audience are shaking their head. Yes, they do know. Well, we're going to take a look in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. As I deal with this question, and really what this seventh chapter is about is a message that Stephen preached right before they stoned him to death. And he recounts some of the history of Israel to show how God was with their forefathers, like Abraham and Joseph and David and others. Where is God when you need him? I'm going to ask that we bow in prayer as I begin. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for, once again, this chance to be in your house, to worship you and serve you, to love you. And Lord, help us all to be willing to obey you. As we studied a little earlier in Sunday school about the reluctant prophet, that runaway missionary, and how Jonah, instead of going to the task you set before, ran the opposite direction. But then, Lord, you brought about the circumstances through the storm, through the whale or the great fish, and Jonah finally went and preached to the Ninevites, and they repented and responded in faith, and they were spared. So too, dear Lord, America is not a righteous nation so much anymore. And America needs to repent and get right with you. From the top all the way down to the bottom, we need your help. So Lord, speak to our hearts today. As many in this country are celebrating our independence, help them to understand the reason why and that you definitely had a hand in the formation and founding of this great nation, and that, Lord, you're still blessing us today, but we're losing much of the blessing because so many people have turned from you. 
We ask that we might see your love, Lord Jesus, and the salvation that you offer. I pray in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Folks, we face many a crisis in life. We're just now kind of coming off of a year of the virus and the lockdowns and the mask wearing and, and all these changes that had to take place to try to protect lives. And our hearts grow out, uh, go out to the family of a, a dear brother of ours who passed away last night and, and in association with the virus and the double pneumonia brought. And we pray for his wife and, and for his family. Where's God when you need him? We're, there are other crises that we're facing. Along with that virus, we find that many people were not able to work. Their jobs had closed down or the businesses were shut down because of uh, protection or, or uh, ways to try to keep people safe from the spread of the coronavirus. People have other events in their life. Family members get sick. And over this past year, there were people who ended up in the hospital and their family was not even allowed to go visit them in the hospital because of the crisis of this pandemic. Sometimes our vehicles break down. We don't have money to pay our bills. Sometimes it's a, a health issue of our own that we have to face. But we all have a crisis in our life from time to time. And despite all of our problems, if we were honest, we could look around and find someone worse off than we are. Do your feet hurt? Look around and it wouldn't take too long to find that there are other people that don't even have any feet or arms. Or if they do, they might be paralyzed. A paraplegic has lost the use of two limbs. A quadriplegic, as many people are, have lost the use of all four of their limbs, both arms and both legs. We are in many ways blessed. We are blessed so much and how often do we forget to thank god for our blessings amen we often spend our lives worrying about ourselves, and it's like oh me and how bad i have it when we ought to be thankful for the blessings that we have and realize that there are others who don't have many of the things that we have we have the savior as a christian you have the lord's presence in your life and many people in the crises of their lives don't even have the Lord God. They're not truly repenting of their sin and, and in touch with Jesus. And therefore, they don't even sense the presence of God in their lives. I believe you and I are blessed to be, to be living in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And I'm thankful for America. Unlike that Olympic trial athlete, who decided to turn her back during the national anthem and cover her face with a, a shirt or whatever, or cover her head. If she doesn't like this country, she's free to leave. That's one of the wonderful things about America. If America was so bad, like some people try to tell us it is, why are hundreds of thousands of people every year trying to get into our borders and come into our country? America is a wonderful nation, though we have our faults. You may have noticed in our uh, bulletin today, there was a, a short quote of John Wayne. And uh, John Wayne said, sure, I wave the American flag. Do you know a better flag to wave? Sure, I love my country with all her faults. I'm not ashamed of that. Never have been. Never will be. Nobody is saying that America is perfect. But America is here because God wanted America here. And we are blessed. I'm proud to be an American. In Acts chapter number 7, Stephen has been brought forth before a Jewish council because he's been preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. They had a short time before crucified the Lord, and he rose from the grave. He ascended up into heaven 40 days later. And Stephen was one of the early followers there in the church in Jerusalem. And in fact, he was one of the men who were selected to be deacons in that early church. In Acts chapter 7, we find out that uh, Stephen begins to share the word of the Lord. He begins to, to tell these Jewish leaders 
about some of their Jewish history and how God has been there when people needed him. He was sharing with them basically the answer to the question of my message today. Where is God when you need him? We're going to pick this up in Acts 7 with verse number 2, and I'll read down through verse 8. And he, this is Stephen, said, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And said unto him, Get thee out of this country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the uh, land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him unto this land, into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that they shall come forth and shall serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat twelve the twelve patriarchs. Stephen was pointing out here that God was with Abraham when he was in Ur of the Chaldees in Mesopotamia. God was with Abraham when he was in the land of Haran. God was with Abraham in the land of Canaan, that promised land. God was with Abraham wherever he went, even though Abraham had no building to worship God in, God was with Abraham. God gave Abraham the custom of circumcision as a sign of his covenant there with him in that foreign land. God not only made a covenant with Abraham, but with his descendants. Just as the Lord led Abraham to a new land to establish a new nation, so did the Lord lead our forefathers hundreds of years ago to come into this new land and to establish a new nation that we call America. Stephen went on in his message in verses 9 and 10 to explain how God was with Joseph as well. Verse 9, And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. And God delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Stephen points out that God was with Joseph when he was sold as a slave in Egypt. Yes, there was slavery back in those times. God was with Joseph while he was in prison in Egypt. He was falsely accused for a crime that he did not commit. Then God was with Joseph when he was promoted as the governor of the land of Egypt. And God was with Joseph Though he had no building to worship God in, God was with Joseph throughout his life. You don't need to be in a building that we call church to be in the presence of the Lord and to have the Lord in your life. We assemble here once a week, as the early disciples did on the first day of the week. It's a day that we commemorate the resurrection of the Lord, and it's a day when the church met to praise and worship the God who gives salvation. Now, I mentioned about slavery here, because slavery was a part of the culture in ancient times. It is a horrible evil. Slavery has existed on every continent, in every nation, in every age of human history, and has affected every family line in one way or another. Slavery is not something new. And although our nation tolerated slavery in its early years, over 150 years ago we fought a war to free 
the slaves here in America. It was fought to guarantee that the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution applied to all. And again, I say I'm proud to be an American. I'm not proud of everything that America has done, but I'm proud to be an American. We fixed the problem of slavery, but there's a lot more work that we need to do. I think one of the things we failed on since the early 1970s is we have not stopped the horrible sin of abortion in the land. Surely God is very displeased with America. We haven't stopped human trafficking and sex trafficking. Not just those coming across the border, but even within our own borders. That abuse and slavery is still taking place. Just as Americans fought for our independence and liberty in the past to make us one nation under God, we need to fight against the evil and the wickedness and the sins of our nation in this present day. Understand that today the enemy is not soldiers in red coats from Great Britain. Our enemy, though, is very subtle and deceiving. The enemy is working in our government, in our media, in our education systems, and in sports. Instead of teaching history to our students, our schools are teaching now, in many places, the lie of the critical race theory. They're teaching that uh, our children's worth is based on the color of their skin. That's a wrong teaching. It's a lie. It, it's a misrepresentation of the history of America. And I, for one, I'm a long-term public school teacher. I've taught in the public school systems nearly 30 years. And I would advise any parent who has children or, or those that have grandchildren to be careful about keeping their children in public school. Check out the school system. Know what the teachers are teaching. I think we've got a good school system here in North Mississippi. We've got a lot of Christian teachers, Christian administrators, Christian school board, and I'm thankful that a lot of the false teaching and lies has been kept out of our school system. But in many places, even in our own state of Mississippi, this false theory of critical race theory is coming into the schools, taught along with evolution and other things that are wrong, and they're bringing in this transgendered questioning culture to basically infect the minds of our children. I don't think I could send my children to public school today unless I knew that it was a good Christian school system. Parents, you've got to watch out for those little ones. When they come into children that are five and six years old and begin to tell them maybe they were born as a boy, but if they think they want to be a girl, they can change to be a girl and vice versa. When they have boys competing against girls in girls' sports, saying that, boy, well, I call myself a girl today, and I'm an athlete, so the boys are going to win most of those competitions because they're made physically bigger and stronger, generally speaking. This idea is wrong. We don't want the guys in the girls' bathrooms and showers and locker rooms. What has happened to America? The things that used to make sense and the things that we would never have questioned before are now turned upside down and things just are not making much sense today. We do have problems in our nation and we've got to face those problems and solve them. Well, I want to go on because I am preaching out of Acts chapter 7. But I'll tell you what, before I do that, there is an article that I found this past week. Some of you may have heard of Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey has had financial advice programs for many, many years. He is Christian and uh, loves the Lord. I found an article that he wrote recently. And I'm going to share that with you. This morning, Dave Ramsey wrote in a column, I realized that everything is about to change. No matter how I voted, no matter what I say, lives are never going to be the same. I've been confused by the hostility of family and friends. I look at people I have known all my life, so hate-filled that 
They agree with opinions they would never express as their own. I think that I may well have entered into the twilight zone. You can't justify this insanity. We have become a nation that has lost its collective mind. Somehow, it's un-American for the census to count how many Americans are in America. People who say that there is no such thing as gender are demanding a female president. Universities that advocate equality discriminate against Asian Americans in favor of African Americans. Some people are held responsible for, for things that happened before they were born, and other people are not held responsible for what they are doing right now. Criminals are caught and released to hurt more people, but stopping them is bad because it's a violation of their rights. People who have never owned slaves should pay slavery reparations to people who have never been slaves. After legislating gender, if a dude pretends to be a woman, you are required to pretend with him. People who have never been to college should pay the debts of college students who took out huge loans for their degrees. Illegal immigrants with tuberculosis and polio are welcome to come into the country. But you better be able to prove your dog is vaccinated. Irish doctors and German or Indian engineers who want to immigrate to the U.S. must go through rigorous vetting process. But any illiterate gangbangers who jump the southern fence are welcome. If you cheat to get into college, you go to prison. But if you cheat to get into the country, you go to college for free. And pointing out all this hypocrisy somehow makes us racists. Nothing makes sense anymore. No values, no morals, no civility, and people are dying of a Chinese virus, but it's racist to refer to it as a Chinese, even though it began in China. Dave closed his article saying, Wake up, America. The great unsinkable ship, Titanic America, has hit an iceberg and is taking on water and sinking. Wow. I like what he said. And there's nothing in there that I would disagree with. Let's go on and look at the next part of Stephen's sermon, shall we? In Acts chapter 7, I'm going to read starting with verse 20 through 22, and then I'll share verse 37. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now skip down to verse 37. That is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. Stephen was pointing out that God was with Abraham throughout his life. God was with Joseph throughout his slavery and imprisonment and then being promoted to a high position in the Egyptian government. He now is telling us that God was with Moses in the desert. And I skipped a lot of the verses. There are just too many to read. But Moses went out when he was about 40 years old to check on his brethren, the Jews. And he saw an Egyptian slave, a slave master who was beating a, a, a Jewish man, nearly beating him to death. And so Moses went after the Egyptian slave master and ended up killing the Egyptian. And he was looking around. Nobody happened to see him, he thought. And so he left, went back, I guess, to Pharaoh's place. And then he came back the next day to check on him. And there were two Israelites who were striving, arguing with each other, shoving one another, and he tried to break them up. And, and the one said to him, the one who was doing the shoving, he said, will you kill me too like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? And Moses took off running. He ended up spending 40 years in the desert, but God was with him in the desert. God was with Moses when he was an infant, when he was floating in the bulrushes in that little basket that his mama had weaved. God was with Moses while he was growing up in Pharaoh's house. God was with Moses 
when he was in the backside of the desert in Midian and on Mount Sinai. God was with Moses and Israel throughout the Exodus and their wilderness wanderings. And God was with Moses even though he had no building to worship God in. Moses told the children of Israel someday God would raise up a prophet. And that great prophet was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pick up the message again in verse 44. And I'll go through 47. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers under the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. Stephen is saying that God was with David as he ruled over the nation Israel. God was with David and blessed David so that David could raise the resources, the money, and the building material to build a temple to the Lord. But God said because David was a man of war that he would not allow David to build that temple. God was with David, even though he had no building to worship God in, no permanent structure. But God did allow Solomon to build the temple for his worship. And God was with Solomon as he ruled over the nation Israel. Solomon was a wise man, the wisest ever born of woman. Stephen was making it clear that the temple was something that Solomon's father David wanted to build. And God was with Solomon with a building or without a building. God is with his people with a building or without a building. Where is God when you need him? The answer is he's always close by. The Lord is always with his people who are with him. If you will draw close to the Lord, he will draw close to you. That's scripture. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is that when, when people start wondering, where is God when I need him? You need to check where you are at in relation to God because God doesn't move. You must have been the one to move. You get close to the Lord and he will be close to you. But Stephen here in this chapter was preaching to a bunch of hard-hearted, self-righteous, religious hypocrites who had no place for the Lord God in their lives. They're the ones that they wanted Jesus to be dead and done away with. They were happy to crucify him. Look at what Stephen said in verses 51 and 52. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Stephen pointed out their lying hypocrisy. They were not going to take that. And they got angry, and that's why in a few verses later, and I won't take time to read that, but they stoned Stephen to death. And as they're stoning Stephen, he's looking up into heaven. He said, prayed and said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And he looks up, and he said, I see Jesus there. He saw Jesus in heaven ready to welcome Stephen home. Just as I believe that the Lord welcomed our brother Sherman home during the night on July 4th of 2021. The human race has always struggled with hatred and murder ever since the days of Cain, right? Right at the beginning. We're living in a country filled with hate and murder. Wicked people hated the Lord Jesus then and crucified him at Calvary. And wicked people still hate the Lord Jesus today. They hate his word, the Bible. They hate his people, Christians like you and like me. But but this hatred and, and murder is going to be with us until the Lord comes back to rule and to reign on the throne of David. It was through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that our salvation was purchased. And you know what? God is looking for people who will serve him and love him and obey him. 
God's looking for such people. Are you listening to the Lord to speak to you when you need comfort? If you find yourself asking, where is God when I need him? Stop and think of where you are. And if you are not close to the Lord, if you're not, you need to get that problem fixed. The scriptures that I printed in our bulletin today, I thought were really good. And I want to close with reading those verses again. From Psalm 85, the psalmist writes, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. If you wonder where's God when I need him, just make sure that you're close to him. He will speak if you will listen. Verse 9, surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. I want America to be strong. And the way for America to be strong is for Christians to be strong, for Christian families to be strong, for churches to be strong, for communities and counties and states to be strong. That's the only way that America can be strong. And I believe the Lord still wants to bless us and use us as a nation. Verse 10, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. Get close to God. He's there when you need him. All you have to do is pray. Just talk to him. Just ask. And ask. And ask again. Ask in faith. And believe that you will receive what God has for you. God doesn't promise to give us our greeds but he does promise to meet our needs. So ask in faith, according to his will and in his name, and God will hear and answer the, pra the prayers of his children. We know how that works, right? Little kids, you see them in the grocery store and they start asking for something and they keep asking and asking and asking and asking. <laughs> they don't quit, do they? They might be down on the floor of the store, kicking and screaming and hollering. And most of the time, mom and daddy's going to break down and give them what they want. Well, maybe in a way we need to not necessarily kick and scream and holler when we ask something of God, but we should be persistent in prayer and ask in faith. God loves to give gifts to his children. And the greatest gift of all is the gift of salvation. God delights in that. There is joy there in heaven when a sinner repents and gets right with the Lord. I caught a little bit of a message on TV this morning from David Jeremiah. Some of you, I think, listened to him. And he was telling the story, and I'm not sure how well I remember it, but, you know, uh, Mama you usually took care of the, the, the young boy uh, in getting him put to bed, but she had to be gone one evening, and so... Uh, that was daddy's responsibility. And he hadn't been involved in, in the bedtime routine so much. And mama just said, well, you know, make sure he gets to bed, gets to sleep, but he might ask you for a glass of water or something. And uh, he got the boy put to bed. He went downstairs to relax in the living room. And in just a few minutes, he hears that voice, daddy, daddy. He said, what do you need? He said, I'm thirsty. I want a glass of water. So he gets up, takes some glass of water, said, okay, now get to bed and go to sleep. A little bit. Daddy! Daddy! What do you need, boy? i got to go to the bathroom. Okay, well, let's go to the bathroom, get that done. Now stay in bed and don't ask for anything anymore. And a little bit. Daddy! Daddy, I'm still thirsty. Can I have a glass of water? I don't know why the daddy didn't leave the glass up there to begin with. <laughs> but he wasn't thinking. So Danny goes up there, takes him the water, and he said, now listen, boy, I don't want to hear anything else out of you. You be quiet. You go to sleep, and that should be the end of it. 
And I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the end of what he said in the story. Anyway, it was a little while later he heard that soft voice, Daddy, Daddy. And Daddy was upset. He had already chewed him up. And I can't remember what the thing was the boy asked for. It's probably another glass of water. But the daddy gave in. And the point of uh, David Jeremiah in sharing this story was that ask God. God's not like an earthly dad who gets tired of running up the stairs carrying the glass of water to the boy. God wants us to ask in faith. You can't ask him too much. And God's going to answer our prayers either saying yes or no or wait. It may not be the time. He will answer our prayers. We've got to listen. Where's God when you need him? He's there. And if you need him, just ask. Ask in faith. Continue to ask in faith until you understand God's answer. It's either yes or no or wait. He loves you. That's why our heads in a word of prayer. We ask Josiah to come and prepare with a song of invitation. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Thank you for this wonderful sermon from Stephen, Lord, who recalled Israel's history to show these wicked people how they and, and even their forefathers had persecuted the prophets and put them to death and that they had had a part in crucifying the Lord Jesus and crying for his blood and that these same people were now going to be responsible for the death of Stephen and yet with the compassion of you, Lord Jesus Christ, Stephen forgave them. And Stephen, as he looked up into heaven, knew that you were going to receive him to his eternal reward. Lord, I thank you that we can know that you're close to us. Those times when we need you, you are close by. And we just have to reach out by faith and call upon you. Because you promise in the scriptures that if we'll call upon you, you will hear us and you will answer. Thank you, Lord. That as your child, I know I can call on you at any time, day or night. I want to praise you, Lord, for your blessings of this life. Thank you for America, for this land in which we live. Thank you that we can celebrate this day of our independence. But even more so, we should celebrate and be reminded every day of the great deliverance through the salvation by the blood of our Savior. And the fact that you tell us to come boldly before the throne of grace so that we may receive the help that we need, that help in time of need, the help that you're willing to give us. And so, Lord, we don't need to crawl on our faces and bellies to you, but rather we come as children into your presence, knowing, dear Lord, that we're welcome at any time. Lord, would you glorify yourself? Bless this family today who's having their reunion and we ask, dear Lord, that you'll be with those who have lost loved ones and those who are troubled over sickness of family, friends, or self, that you may provide the answers that they need. I would ask in Jesus' name. Amen.